And we're going to talk about the unexpected turn that things took for Tom, something truly unusual that happened along the way, the contacts he made in the UFO field that are absolutely unprecedented. Welcome back to the program, Tom DeLong. Tom, good How to are you? I hope I didn't build it up too much there. You know, I was listening to that intro, and I was like, my God, I sound amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting here kind of going, oh, they're all going to figure me out pretty soon, that I'm just a, a pretty normal guy. But I, I, I'm so excited to be here. This is, uh, this is always – I listened to Coast to Coast for um, 20-some years, and this is my, what is my third time being on here, and yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's such a rush. Well, this one's going to be a rush for everybody, I think, involved. I want to start with a little bit about you. I know you don't want to talk about this, but just for the benefit of the uh, the listeners who were not Blink or Angels fans, uh, tell me a, a little bit about the musical career, how well you did, because uh, the decision you made to change away from that, at least to some extent, uh, it becomes all the more dramatic. Yeah, well, I, you know, I've been playing music as far back as I can remember, and when you start a band, you never think that you're going to go anywhere. So the biggest dreams and aspirations I had at the time were to play in front of neighbors, you know. So I was, like, having these big, you know, fanciful um, daydreams about playing in my cul-de-sac growing up. But the band uh, was at the right place at the right time, um, you know, and, and we did something that I think resonated with a lot of with a lot of kids at the time, we we kind of became the band known for you know speaking for suburbia and then MTV was exploding so with a little bit of luck we had kind of some of the right material to to land on that channel and then you know the band exploded in the 90s and we um ever since we've had a career and uh you know, I, but all, along the way you know you mentioned yeah I had other things I was into there was always so much more to who I was, but, you know, obviously everyone knows me because of the music, but, you know, just like anybody else out there, when I'm not on stage for the other 23 hours of the day, um, I was always doing other stuff. I, I kid you about this, uh, it, both in person and, and once on the air before, about your f fans. You know, since I've come to know you, I follow you on social media, and I see what the fans say. Oh, no, there's there's Tom on his UFO binge again. So they chide you a little bit. Some of it is, you know, is fun. And some of it, they don't want you to deal with it. But but it's always been there. Well, you know, I will tell you this. And I, and, and I think I even mentioned this to you in some of our conversations uh, that weren't on the air, is I even dealing with the Secret Machines project, I have met uh, or come across people that, you know, the, the, the subject can rub people the wrong way. But I've found people that have built up walls that have been, you know, uh, so much taller and thicker than than any wall that you would think somebody would build up, maybe because they're scared of the belief systems that they have and they don't want, you know, they, you're coming at them with something that really shakes them. So, you know, but I don't know if that's the way, you know, fans and, and, and people are, in the, you know, on my social media, if they're scared of the material or they just want me to go focus and do the music that they grew up and, and love, which is probably most likely it. But I'll, But just for conversation's sake, I, you know, being into this subject, and you know this, even more than I, some people just like, nope, don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear it. Blinders on. I got to go to work, you know, and, right. and sometimes they see it on the Internet, too. Uh, let's talk about your own experience, because you had an interest in this for a long time before you had anything like a, a paranormal or UFO type experience. But on a camping trip, this is in the last this is fairly recent. Recently, you had something really strange happen out in the desert. Yeah, I did. You know, and it's it's been the subject of uh, a lot of interviews lately. We just had Rolling Stone in bed, uh, a journalist with me last week for a um, handful of days, and they're going to help break this story um, right after we do tonight in the next issue of Rolling Stone, which is on the 8th. But even he was bringing up, he's like, what's going on with this camping trip, you know? Um, I did an interview with Paper Magazine, kind of, they're like a modern art magazine, and they wanted to do something on this subject, and they asked me, and I just kind of let the floodgates open. Once again, you know, I'm just talking and, and thinking out loud as I'm talking, <laughs> then you see it in print later, and you go, oh my God, people aren't going to understand this, and they're going to think I'm nuts, but, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, well, you know, before I tell you what's interesting here, let me tell you about what happened. We went out on the, on to go film, and it was part of this this documentary for the Secret Machines project, and we wanted to go out 
and uh, start collecting footage. So we were on our way out to the what's known as the NTS or Nevada test site. You are the person who kind of told the entire world about the existence of Area 51. I mean, for anyone listening, if you if you know the term Area 51, George here is the one that that taught you it. But um, that's not the only base out there. There's a lot of bases out there. There's a few bases, you know, out um, west of there, and one was called China Lake, and we were trying to get our way out there, but it was too far of a drive at the time, so we, we decided to pull off the road outside of China Lake, and we were probably 100 miles from any gas station. I mean, we were somewhere on the fringes of Death Valley, but um, all I know is that we were off-roading for quite a while until we found a valley to camp in, and so we uh, I've done it a few other times for fun, um, and we have to back go backwards a little bit. There was an individual that was very prominent in the UFO field for a while, and he was kind of all the rage, and uh, he came up with this whole concept that you that the any any the UFOs themselves or any advanced civilization was going to speak to its to or communicate <clears throat> on the level of consciousness, uh, the frequency of consciousness. Not they're not going to be using you know AM FM radios or whatever. So. So he had this whole concept that if you meditate and you do a certain protocol when you meditate, these things can show up, you know, and I didn't know what to believe at the time, but I did meet a few uh, professors from universities that were working with this guy, and they told me directly, oh, my God, we've seen landings and stuff. And I was like, really? You really? You know, so we would go out there. I took a couple buddies out there, and uh, we, we would have fun and, and not really be sober, uh, but we wanted to try it out either. <laughs> Nothing ever really happened for us. But on this camping trip, we said, let's do it again, you know, and so we're, you're not doing anything. You're in the middle of the desert, so we tried it. And I remember uh, when, when right before we start this meditative kind of proto, the, the protocol, you know, it's step by step. You got to do certain things. I remember telling them, okay, I don't think anything's going to happen necessarily. We should try this. But if anything does happen, it's going to happen at three in the morning, you know. And the two guys that were with me were like, "Why three? I'm, I don't know. It's just what time it always happens. If you read about people that have like abduction, uh, abductions, or if they have sightings, or they, anything that's weird at night with this." phenomenon somehow it always happens around that time or a lot of the time it does so uh we go through like a couple hours of this meditation nothing happens and um and then finally we're like okay it's time to go to bed you know so we all cram into this tent in the middle of nowhere i mean we are in the middle of nowhere and the fire's still going on outside the tent so it's kind of all illuminated in there so you get the sleeping bags right you know say a few dumb jokes and we go to sleep I wake up and I hear hundreds of people talking around the tent, like hundred, like so many voices. I can't make out anything. Uh, I just, it's just, uh, it, it was, it was a chorus of voices. It was, it, I, th then all of a sudden this thought enters my mind instantly. Oh, it's just a bunch of uh, special ops soldiers on some multi-day hike coming through our tent uh, area. Uh, everything's cool. We're good, you know. And I, and I close and I close my eyes, open back up. The fire's out. A couple hours have passed, and I'm just like, "What the hell was that?" So I woke everybody up um, first thing in the morning, super early. And uh, I was like, oh, my God, did you guys hear that? Did you hear that? Did you hear all those voices? And uh, one guy was like, no, not at all. I slept fine. But the other guy was like, yes. I heard people talking all around our tent. So I wasn't the only one. So I, felt, I didn't feel too wildly crazy. But this is where it gets really interesting. Um, uh, you know, George, you know, uh, John, is it John Keel, the, the researcher yeah. from the 70s? Yeah. He, uh, he, you know, our, our, our good friend Jeremy Corbell actually Instagrammed his book, Trojan Horse, uh, not too long ago. It's from the 70s. It had a reprint. And because Jeremy Instagrammed it, I was like, oh, I want to check that book out. So I bought it. And I'm reading it, and I was like, oh, my God. Somewhere around the first third of the book, it gets into this whole uh, – this is from the 70s, mind you. Um, it gets into this whole scenario where a lady sees a UFO, or a car gets pushed over to the side of the road, and it, then she hears a chorus or a choir of voices, just so many voices she can't hear what it is. They're swirling around the entire area, and it, and it just step by step goes through the exact same thing that happened to me out in the desert. So uh, as we get into the conversation later tonight, one of the first things I did when I met uh, the very important people we're going to talk about, I sent that over and I said, this is exactly what All went right. on with Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Marvin Gaye is telling us we need to take a break. Our conversation with Tom DeLong will pick up in a minute and uh, we'll, we'll uh, get back into that story of his strange experience in the desert. Much more to come here at Coast to Coast AM. 
I don't know if my guest tonight would agree with this, but I think this is a musical ancestor of Tom DeLonge's, uh, surf rockers known as the Shantays, a song called Pipeline from way back in 1963. We're talking with my guest Tom DeLonge about uh, a somewhat amazing transformation he's made in his personal and professional life, uh, sort of rechanneling his fortune and his energies away from music and into UFOs. And whether you believe the story that we're going to tell tonight about these amazing contacts that he's made who want this story out. Um, there's nobody that's uh, launched anything quite like this project, Secret Machines, movies, films, books, uh, documentaries, and uh, we're going to get into that in the next seg- segment. Stick around. Much more to come here on Coast to Coast AM. So for the last 60 years or so, if you say UFO, somebody saw a UFO, the thoughts go to space aliens. These might be visitors from some other planet. People like John Keel, who was just mentioned a bit ago by Tom DeLong. And Jacques Vallée and others put a twist on that starting in the 70s, saying maybe these uh, these UFOs, the things we're seeing in the skies, are not interplanetary spacecraft after all. Maybe they're something from closer to home. Uh, Tom, tell me this. Uh, did this experience you had in the desert, which was not sort of a classical alien-type encounter, did it sort of change your take on the overall topic? You know, I don't know if it... It added to my uh, my take. I, I've never believed that UFOs were as simple as just you know a life, you know some kind of life form from another planet. I always thought it was much more complex than that. Um, you know, this to me, I thought that Jacques Vallée w- w- and John Keel, they were both offering explanations that were that were really making somebody think about the absurdity of what UFOs do when people have some type of contact or the abduction experiences or all the cattle mutilations and crop circles and just the weird stuff that it's that it's that it's doing and and that even religious stuff um and and the messages it's telling people so when i had my experience it just kind of added more fuel to the fire that it's a little bit more complex than that and um but honestly that's one of the the great things about the phenomenon once you start studying it and once you try and find um you know different rabbit holes to jump into it's it's kind of never ending because there's so much about this topic and about the phenomenon itself that uh you can you can learn for the next you know 500 decades and only kind of you know break through the surface of it so uh, tell me this how big a role did that experience uh, play in the ultimate decision you made about a year ago to sort of change the focus well, you, you know, for people that are wondering if I care about music, you know, I anymore, I, I do. I'm doing more music now than I ever have, but it is a major shift. So, what I'm, I have a company called To the Stars, and and what we're doing is do uh, kind of communicating large themes and ideas, and and what's called is transmedia, where you do multi-platform releases on a subject. So and that's no different than what you see on your big Marvel or DC Comics movies or stuff that Disney does, even Star Wars, where it's a franchise. It's an idea that lasts for many years, and they do a lot of movies. They'll do animations. They'll do books or whatever. Um, Secret Machines is is like that. All of the releases I'm doing have a piece of music with it, but I, I was, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in things that are very challenging and things that are ambitious um, I, I, I'm not, I don't do well doing the same thing over and over again. Um, if I'm not engaged cerebrally, I, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm dying a slow little death here. So I definitely put a lot on my plate this time. So describe it, describe the parameters of this project, what it involves. Well, uh, I knew that this was the greatest story never told. I knew that you don't even have to sensationalize anything about this subject, uh, and would blow people's minds. Um, I also knew that it's never really been told in an elevated artistic way. You never really had, other than Close Encounters that Spielberg did so many years ago, that's probably the only one on a major level that took it decently seriously and and put concepts out there for people to digest and, and think about and walk away saying, wow, you know, because it was so elevated in the approach. I mean, it's the best director of all time. I thought that uh, we kind of needed to do something like that again, um, but because I because I do know a lot about this subject and I do know the complexities involved and I do know that it is a national security issue and a global security issue, that I didn't want to come out and be this very public figure saying some of these things 
that I knew needed to be said without permission. So the whole project was how do we do major motion pictures with documentaries, with novels, with nonfiction books, with step-by-step -step we kind of entertain and educate. And it all went back to uh, not too many years ago when I was watching that movie 13 Days with Kevin Costner on the Cuban Missile Crisis. We've all been told about the Cuban Missile Crisis in school. They're like, oh, my God, we almost died, and they were going to put weapons in Cuba, and we almost died. Did we tell you that we almost died? You know, And you're like, okay, okay, I got it. And you walk out of high school, and you don't really – the enormity of it thrown on your lap, you don't really digest it. So I was watching that movie, and it kind of, you know, step by step, you go through the debates, and you're seeing the arguments, and you're seeing the fear, and you're seeing how families act, and you're like, wow, that was a pretty heavy time in our history. So I, um, I left, and I went to the bookstore to buy the actual recordings of JFK in the Oval Office. I wanted to hear those debates. I wanted to hear you know, how they dealt with the, you know, the idea that nuclear war could break out at any, any minute. I wanted to see what those guys were saying, you know, to, to figure it out, to decode that, that problem. And, um, and that's what I want to do with this project where you pull people in and you galvanize them over the issue. And then they, they want to go and, and absorb the nonfiction elements. But a funny, a funny story to that JFK thing, when I was standing in line with the JFK tapes, all these CDs at the time, actually, of all the recordings of JFK, the, my phone rings, and I go, hello, and they go, Tom DeLong. I go, yeah. And he goes, this is Senator Ted Kennedy. And I was like, wait, what? He goes, this is Senator Ted Kennedy. And I, and I paused for a second. And I'm all, I, I, told, I was like, I'm holding recordings of your brother. He's all, you are. And I was like, yeah. He's all, hold on a second. You know, hold on a second. He grabs somebody else, gets on the phone. He's all, Tom, this is Senator John Kerry. Come campaign with me. <laughs> and, I, and, that's, and I got into campaigning in Iowa, and people saw me in the elections uh, during that time when he was running for president. But um, this whole entertain and educate model, I think, is, is something that, that needs to happen. So uh, to begin with, uh, the, the books, you have six in mind to start with, fiction, nonfiction? Yeah, so we actually have four of them done. Uh, the, the, not, the fictional, what we call historical fiction, um, or another way that one of my advisors uh, put out for us to put on there was um, threading historical events. But that is coming out on April 5th everywhere. Uh, and then we'll follow it with the first nonfiction book, and we'll just go back and forth between the, the fiction and the nonfiction. Um, we're almost done with the three nonfiction books. We have one completely done, and the other two will be done in the next couple of weeks. So, uh, But the novel itself, it's all 700 pages of it, will be in stores everywhere on the 5th. Well, we're going to talk about secret machines chasing shadows in the next hour when you're joined, we're joined by your co-author. Can you talk about the nonfiction books, what the general subjects are? Yeah, so for some of the people out there that, that live in this world like, like myself, I teamed up with a, an internationally recognized researcher named Peter Lavenda. Peter is what you would call an expert at the occult. And he did a, a lot of famous research about the Nazis and the rat lines and what the Germans were doing after World War II and all the occult, um, you know, the, all, all the weird occult stuff that they were into. And, and uh, when people start to understand more about the UFO phenomenon and when they they, they follow what Secret Machines is going to teach them. And mind you, as we'll talk about this in a little bit, it's not all coming from me. It's coming from other people um, of the highest places. That, you know, there's a, there's a, that, the, the term the occult in that whole world is much more a part of the UFO phenomenon. Than, and and, and, and that may, that's part of what makes it more complex than just little green men and flying saucers and tinfoil hats, you know. So Peter has been writing the nonfiction books um, for just as long as, as AJ's been writing the, the fictional books. So we, we've been working on this for a while. The documentary projects, uh, nonfiction uh, documentaries that you've been working on, I've seen glimpses, some of the stuff, some of the interviews you've done. I, I guess part of that story is the contacts that were developed in, in the course of putting that together. But tell me about uh, the documentary projects uh, as much as you want to reveal right now about the kind of people you're talking to and what those subjects will be. Sure. Um, well, when we started this project, I wanted to document my efforts of meeting the people in charge and telling the story about how uh, I am basically building, hopefully, you know, one of the largest covert communications vehicles that's been put together. 
And because I can't come out and tell everybody who these people are, and because I can't uh, run around showing pictures and resumes and bios of who these, you know, where you know where these people have been, I um, figured the next best way to do it is to document and to tell the story of how I met these people and the information they've been giving me, and um, and how we're going to attempt to communicate some of these things to people. And it's big stuff. It's and some of it, it's scary stuff. And uh, like I said earlier, it's going to hit people's belief systems pretty hard on some on some issues. And and you know, I I uh, it just needs to come in, come out over time. And we need to finesse a certain way to build it all on first. You know, finesse it in a way to where we build it all on on credibility. So when they read the the Secret Machines novel and novels. They understand that we're not just trying to entertain them, that there's things in this book that were given to me that have never been given to the world ever in, in um, relationship to what the UFO phenomenon is and where it's from and, and what it's doing. A lot of this book is laying the foundation for even bigger stuff that's coming on book two. I want to talk for a moment about the political um, scene. And, and I, I'm not endorsing Hillary Clinton I'm not endorsing John Podesta. I don't think you are either. Um, I just find it amazing. And I don't even know if they could they could uh, release the UFO UFO files, even if they could find them. I just find it amazing that during the heat of a campaign that they're talking about it uh, somewhere, it would seem like they've done a big focus group or something that says it's okay. But to me, it doesn't make any sense. It just seems like it's a downer that it could be something they'd be beaten over the head with. Yet you have. You've had very open communications with Podesta. His interest in this goes way, way back, as does hers. Yeah, I think people need to take, um, you know, very, very, very strong notice of what's going on when Hillary Clinton comes on the Jimmy Kimmel show like she did a couple nights ago and says, we are going to dig in and bring out the UFO files, quote, unless it has to do with national security. That was the one caveat. So she's saying this needs to come out, but there might be some things that's going to hold some of it back. And she's letting you know with breadcrumbs here that there are national security issues with this stuff, um, and there are global security issues with this stuff. So her campaign manager, John Podesta, is uh, a very, very powerful and important person. And, and a lot of this audience knows of him because he tweeted a few times about UFOs. One of his famous tweets last year was that his biggest failure for 2014 was not getting the UFO files released. But you have to look at who he is. He got um, President Clinton elected and was his chief of staff and got Obama elected and served as his transitional chief of staff uh, and became and served for the majority of Obama's tenure as his uh, senior advisor. And now he's the campaign chairman for Hillary. So if Hillary wins, he'll most likely be chief of staff for her. So you have a guy that's routinely getting people elected to the highest office in the world and then staying on to either run their office or be their senior advisor. And he's out there talking about UFOs like it's, uh, you know, like it's anything else. Um, And, he is in my docu series, and he was uh, the story. There was I reached out and I told him what I was trying to achieve with this project, and he was very quiet on the phone. He was he was listening, and I kind of went through what my objectives were. And I have my pitch down, but I'm I'm speaking very respectfully, and I'm and I'm trying to lay out you know all the reasons why this needs to happen. But I didn't think that I really got through to him. Uh, and I didn't, I, I, you know, for all I knew, he thought I was just some crazy, you know, rock star that wants to talk about something weird, you know, but I knew he was into this stuff, but I just didn't know how much or whatever. Um, so he, he, you know, he said, call me in a couple months. I'm pretty busy and we'll see where we're at. I was like, cool. I, I never called him back cause I didn't think he was really, you know, absorbing what I pitched him. And, uh, then all of a sudden out of nowhere, I just get this flurry of emails, uh, from his office that he wants to be in this. And I have to come out to D.C., and it's a major priority, and uh, the rest is history. But um, it, it, I think people need to understand that we're, we're in a transition here with this topic and that some really big things are about to happen. Well, that's what I'm trying to get at here is because I know for some listeners who just can't stand Hillary Clinton, 
Um, it's it's trouble. They have trouble even listening to this part of it. But just set that stuff aside for a second and think for a moment about the significance of a major presidential candidate talking about this issue. It's like somebody flipped a light switch or something. Well, you you know, you have an issue that's going to tackle cosmology and religion and scientific breakthroughs that will seem like magic to people. Uh, it'll it'll uh, relationships with countries that we're not supposed to have relationships with, um, you know, defense systems that we've been building secretly with enormous amounts of money for a very long period of time, <clears throat> where people, if they knew about it, would probably be in an uproar until they knew the reasons why. And then they would say, why didn't you tell me? I wish I could have helped you. You know, the more that I found out about this stuff, and once they started giving me the information, I realized that uh, that all these young people are going to look at the at, at these areas of our government and say you guys are heroes you guys are doing heroic stuff I- incredible stuff and no one knows about it and you're letting all these weirdos on the internet define you and say it's all a big conspiracy it's the big bad secret government you know keeping se- secrets because they're better than us or or we can't handle the truth or they're doing it for money and and to be to control the world it nothing could be further from the truth once you understand why they're keeping their efforts secret and what they've been doing you will realize that that um that it's, it's, they need to be empowered and they need to be given every bit of resource that they could possibly need for what, what, they're, what they're doing. And um, I'm excited to tell that part of the story. I'm, ex- I'm excited for people to understand that these are good people doing important work that, thank God, they were doing it. Well, what it makes you wonder is, I, I made the, uh, uh, the comparison to somebody flipping a light switch, whether a green light has been given to a variety of people in the government, that it's okay to start dribbling stuff out. I mean, people are talking to you. Someone yeah. somewhere knows um, knows those conversations are underway. I'm just wondering where ultimately this come from. Did they have a conference call and everybody said, okay, now's the time? Or what do you think about it? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I, I think that I came in and brought an idea to the table that they don't readily or, you know, have. I said, you know, I walked in there with a voice, um, you know, that that they don't they don't really have a position that that speaks to young people the way I do. I also walked in there with, um, you know, a thesis on the phenomenon that is correct, that's totally different than just visitors from another planet. So when they saw that I actually knew what I was talking about, I think that caught them a little bit off guard. <clears throat> and then I also said, uh, you know, I have a plan to do something that looks like this. And I kind of laid out the whole secret machines project. Um, and they probably thought that was really interesting. But when I started executing, when I actually started doing the work and pulling the people together and getting all these advisors and, and writing uh, the novel and the novel being good and the documentary being good and, you know, and, and everything happening the way I said it would, I think um, I built up an enormous amount of trust with these guys, but we have to be really clear here. I, you know, I'm, I'm very respectful. I'm very um, formal about it. I don't. I, I. Everything's a yes sir and no sir. I'm speaking to guys where you can count all the stars on their shoulders. I mean, really. And and I try to run this like a like a real program uh, the the way they would want it run. So everything gets approval. Everything gets sent over, and I get um, you know, just to give you guys an idea. I, I got a call that I was going to do a big interview with Newsweek uh, last week. And so I did the interview. And at the end of the interview, I found out that it was a fake interview and that uh, my company set it up as a way for someone to, to help me craft the message for this because they knew that I was dealing with national security. And that's not something that a musician normally ever has to you know, worry about. So they set up this fake interview. So it wasn't a news. It, you know, it was somebody to help me. They say, well, look, this is the kinds of things you're saying, you know, and, and maybe you shouldn't say this way. But the cool thing about it was they recorded it. So I took that recording and instantly – I was happy about that. I, I, everything else, I was like, "Cool, tell me something. You know, help me say things in a better in a better way." But I, I went that evening, took that recording, and I sent it off to the main the main man, the main man out of ten advisors I I have, and I, uh, you know, uh, is is he's a very big deal. And um, and, and I gave you feedback. I, for, I got feedback, and I got four pages of notes of feedback. Uh, you know, things like saying, "Stop calling it the phenomenon." <laughs> call it UFOs. Make sure right. people well, understand well, what you're talking about. 
All right. In the next hour, we're going to invite your co-author of Secret Machines, the first book, uh, A.J. Hartley, onto the program to talk about the learning curve for him. Then we're going to get into this uh, these 10 advisors or so that you put together one by one, how you uh, got together with them and the kinds of things that they have told you so far. Much more to come here with my guest, Tom DeLong on Coast to Coast AM. This song called Whole Life, recorded in 2003, has never been released on a Paul McCartney album. That's McCartney collaborating with guitarist Dave Stewart of the Eurythmics. Great song. We're talking with musician, vocalist Tom DeLong, who's still making music these days with his band Angels and Airwaves, but also has a lot more on his plate. The umbrella title for this multi-platform project is Secret Machines, the first of, of many books in the series. Secret Machines, Chasing Shadows is available now. Co-written by A.J. Hartley, who will join us in just a moment to talk about the process. Stay with us. Much more to come here on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to the program. A.J. Hartley is the international best-selling author of 14 novels, including the new one, Secret Machines, Chasing Shadows, co-written with my guest uh, Tom DeLong. Uh, A.J. Hartley is a distinguished uh, professor of Shakespeare at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Welcome to the program. Thanks, George. I guess the obvious question is, what's a distinguished guy like you doing in company like this talking about UFOs? <laughs> That's a great question. I sometimes wonder. Uh, but, you know, um, I think uh, these are the kind of questions that uh, that people want to talk about. And um, I, I, my, my, my work as a Shakespearean has always been committed to the idea that, uh, that Shakespeare was, was involved in in, in the kind of stories that uh, that his audience wanted to hear and um, the, the the questions that he wanted to talk about, the people he wanted to talk about, and um, that's always been my way in to, to try and write stories to come up with um, the kind of uh, drama that people just want to um, want to hear. Tom, what was the uh, what was the pitch you made to him, and why did you pick AJ? Well. You know, the, it's easy to pick the guy because he's an incredible, incredible novelist. He's a very elevated writer. Um, I think when you look at his body of work and look at, you know, just the art form itself, what he does, you know, it, it was going to elevate the entire project to have somebody of his caliber uh, come aboard. Um, but what did I tell him? I think it, it was a very impassioned, you know, speech uh, that that we got to do something that's that uh that's never really been attempted before but this is real it's like i let me let me you know i remember i flew him out and just laid out all these documents and just just one by one you, i was probably like you know my hands in the air like i got some huge like i'm running to become president myself and i'm pitching this incredible this story that's never been told before and um i i think i was getting through to him but i didn't know him at the time so i wasn't quite sure if it was you know, if he was absorbing it or if he was thinking I was crazy, but uh, it's probably a better question for him. <laughs> well, A.J., there's a there's a quote in the afterword of the this book that says fiction makes a better, does a better job of the, telling the truth uh, than nonfiction, I guess. Uh, so is this a true story that you're telling in, in a fictional venue? Well, I mean... <laughs> Tom and I talk about this a lot. Obviously, there are a, lot, there are a couple of different kinds of truth. And, and for me as a storyteller, part of the, the truth that I'm trying to tell is a very human one because my first connection w when I'm writing a novel is, is about characters. It's about the stories um, that, that people actually experience and trying to get the truth of that down. Now, as far as the truth of the larger story in, in, in more sort of objective uh, sense, that's that's partly where Tom comes in. That he's retail. He's um, he's relaying information to me all the time based on on the people that he's talking to, and I'm working to incorporate that as best I can. And then, um, and as people then uh, read the, the material, we were sort of they were they were fact checking and they were running interference to make sure that what we were saying was consistent and was in accord with all the best evidence that we had. And there are moments in the book that are, you know, that are based around very clearly documented things, you know, events and things that, uh, well, in one case, there's actually a, a story of something that happened directly to me, 
which I put in and re- remembered in in the terms that I experienced it, put it in the book. Which story is that? It's actually the the the, uh, the, the narrative is divided into the four main characters, um, and each one has a sort of running, uh, alternating story all the way through the book. But those narratives are interspersed with uh, what we call interludes, just um, little moments that have come from outside their particular those char- those four characters' story, things that come from. Um, some history or, yeah. or other kinds of documentation. And the first one in the book is uh, an encounter, a sighting uh, from, a not, from, from a nobody, from, a, from an ordinary person who happens to be in Japan in the late 80s and sees something strange. And that person was me. I, I noticed you, have a, you had a chapter on Wilfred de Brouwer and the, uh, the sightings in late 1989 there. There was one on Betty and Barney Hill. Uh, there was a, a, a short chapter on Admiral Richard Byrd. So you intersperse those things with uh, the activities of your characters. I thought it was a nice touch. It also reminded me of Close Encounters, how you bring – it starts with these disparate characters all over different parts of the world, and then the threads of the story bring them all together. And you bring them together – I don't want to give away too much, but – uh, my state of Nevada has a heck of a lot to do with it. That's right. That's right. Uh, one of the, the challenges, I think, when, when Tom and I first started talking about uh, the book, and and he was saying, you know, I want to I want to cover this period and, and and things happening in all over the world. And for me, as a novelist, I'm thinking, okay, how how the hell am I going to make that work as a single narrative? And we sort of hit on the idea of of weaving those four main stories together, um, but that to make the the narrative feel coherent, to make to, to get a sense of of unity and progression towards a particular end, it made sense to try and somehow bring all of those four stories into a single timeline and a single place, and uh, in the process also to, to for the chapters to start getting shorter and shorter and more uh, surprising and more action driven as the narrative sort of builds to a climax. And Tom, I, I want to uh, throw something in, too. Sure. Uh, this worked to my advantage when I started meeting the people within the government because I was explaining how we would insert important information. And the, and the genius of what A.J. was able to put together was that each uh, character is learning something on their own journey. So, you know, we, we have a pilot that gets promoted to what he doesn't understand is a civilian program, even though it's kind of being run by the government military or, you know, there's another there's another lady that is her father is a world banker and she has to take over his duties and understand that he was privately financing these weird aerospace companies. And, and you know, you go through all these characters, but they each have to learn something. And the reason that worked really well when I met the people within the government was, I was able to say, you know, as we put information that has never been out there into these stories, um, then the people reading them and the viewers of the feature films and the television series and, and however we put it out there will learn the stuff step by step with the character so we won't throw too much on somebody's lap that scares them. Because, frankly, the stuff that I've gotten over the past two months um, – that we're going to be putting in book two is some pretty scary stuff, you know? And, and so it really worked to our benefit to let, uh, to let it all go forward with the support of these people. So you started with one book and you started with one book in mind and it changed, uh, in the course of writing it because of these encounters and uh, you had with real people who were telling you things that you didn't know before. Right. Well, we we knew, uh, you know, AJ and I knew we were going to do at least, you know, three books, but we didn't know what they would have in it. You know, we just tackled this first one. We knew the scope of this this subject matter. We we had ideas of how we wanted to kind of lay it out on a macro level. Um, but I will say absolutely 100 percent that the communications that I'm getting now is giving is going to give us far and away uh, most of the material, um, uh, you know, for book number two. You know, we're going to be getting into the oceans. <laughs> we're going to be getting into um, 
viruses. We're going to be getting into a lot of different stuff. Um, but AJ is going to be able to, to sit down and, and through all of this madness, <laughs> have it make sense and be palatable. And that's a uh, thank God that he's here with us. AJ, let me ask you this. I mean, people study this topic for decades and they still don't get their, head, their heads around it. I'm one of them. You know, I'm, I can imagine the learning curve for putting something like this together. It's pretty steep. It is. I, I, and that was the one thing. You know, I think uh, Tom and I started talking what, about 18 months ago or so, and initially that was the thing that I found hardest just to get started. Um, and, uh, you know, as you say, there's a lot to learn. Tom, Tom was sending me books. He was sending me, um, you know, links to, to documents online, the YouTube videos, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I was getting a bit overwhelmed and... Um, and, and again, you know, trying to then find a way to turn that into a, sing, a single coherent narrative that would work as a, as a novel, right, as well as, you know, a documentary. So, so you've got multiple challenges ahead, synthesizing the material, learning the material, turning it into a book that, that ordinary people are going to find entertaining as well as, in, uh, as, as compelling. And, and I remember getting close to the end of Year Before Last, uh, and thinking, oh my God, okay. So I've got it. So the first chapter I, I'm, I'm writing, and I was committed to, was this putting my, myself in the position of a fighter pilot over Afghanistan, and and, and that's no picnic, you know, <laughs> writing when when you're not a pilot, fighter pilot or who has experience flying over Afghanistan, you know, just getting into that mindset and knowing exactly what it's like to be. In a, in a plane and, you know, make it feel like it's absolutely real. And, and, and Tom had said this a thousand times. It's got, it's got to feel real. It's got to, we got to, we're telling an, a really important story and it's got to feel absolutely compelling. So, you know, it, it, it was a huge amount of research. And then I still found myself, you know, getting on the phone with fighter pilots and saying, okay, and then what do you do? And then and how do you make the, sh the, the plane do this? And, how, you know, all that sort of stuff. And getting them to, to vet what I was saying um, so that it was so that it was working. And, and, and it was still nerve-wracking to send the first 10,000 words or so to Tom and say, is, is, am I in the ballpark? Is this what you're looking for? You know, one of the uh, scenarios, again, without giving the whole thing away, but you've uh, we discussed the idea of cover up and the the government cover up. And of course, there is no the government. There's a there's a great big apparatus. Uh, one hand often doesn't know what the other is doing for a subject like this. The chances are and you and I can get into this later, Tom, but the chances are the people who really know the big picture, you can almost count them on your fingers. Um, you you guys have a, a plot device in there where. It's private money outside the government that, that funds sort of some of the stuff that's going on there, which is sort of the scenario that I've come to, to believe is probably true, that whatever hardware might exist, it would make sense that it would be outside the purview of government, that people, some people within government might know about it, but, but that it would make sense to take it out of government into private hands or another government's hands or somewhere where FOIA couldn't be used, something like that. It was that... Was that how you intended to do it all the way along, Tom? Is that scenario? It, it is. And I, I think, you know, for people that look into this subject long enough, they're going to see um, some threads that have been around for a very long time. I mean, one of the threads is, uh, you know, that when the first crashes happened, we pulled together intelligence, military, um, and private industry, and we all and we brought those brightest minds together and said, "What do we do? And 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 uh, and how do we attack this?" And one of the things they we do to this day is big private companies, or even publicly traded companies, uh, but they're still not government <laughs> companies. You know, it's still not like uh, the military isn't building their own craft somewhere. They use really, really incredible minds um at at big public or, or private companies but they're still kind of operating underneath the department of defense but they're not really a part of the government but they're doing their own thing but what they're building they don't really own you know it's a really interesting way of how it works um i i was amazed when you know i have a i have a group 
out of the ten advisors that I have, uh, three of them are of the brightest scientific and engineering minds in the entire um, military industrial complex. These are the guys that work, you know, nine months out of the year. They work over at Area 51, you know, and that's the truth. And uh, to learn kind of how things are is it's 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 so different than what you what you come up with by reading just all these dumb conspiracy blogs your whole life, which we've all fallen into if you like this stuff, because where else are you going to go? Um, but they might be building something that truly is, uh, has anti-gravity, uh, but they don't own it, even though they're paying for it, and it's theirs kind of, and they're, it's their own building, uh, but the building's on government land, but it's just really, it's kind of convoluted, but it's uh, it's an interesting dance, and um I, uh, I, I, it's just, I don't know. I'm, I, I find myself, I'm like, I feel like I'm a kid that's walking in a museum and he's just blown away by every little painting on the wall, you know, and, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to be respectful and not keep asking, you know, too many absurd questions, but, uh, I, I'm hoping that people realize what we're doing is real and it's going to make its way into these books and into the films and they're going to, you're going to learn a whole lot. AJ, uh, using the novel as the approach, as the venue for telling this part of the story, it also allows plausible deniability uh, for the people who are guiding Tom and giving you information uh, via him as proxy. Um, it allows them to say, well, this it's just fiction. You know, don't take it too seriously if that's what they want to do, while at the same time guiding the structure of the story. Exactly. I, I think you're right. Yeah, it, it's a great way. And, and you know, you, your reference before to Close Encounters is a good one because that's a story about people experiencing this phenomenon exclusively from the outside. And we wanted a blend of that um, with, with, ex, with the exploring of people who are increasingly on the inside of the story. But as you say, ultimately... Everybody is shaped by it, it's a novel, right? It's a, it's a, a work of fiction. So yes, um, and uh, I think you know Tom can speak to this perhaps more directly. But we were constantly being presented with information where we felt we were being led in very particular directions, but there was that uh, that, that that House of Cards type line, if you know the original British TV show, where. They would say where somebody would say something, and the minister would say, "Well, you might think that, but I, I can't possibly comment." And that's their way of saying, "Yes, that's exactly what's going on," but uh, I, I'm not going to tell you officially. Is there anything that Tom shared with you, or you learned uh, as part of this learning curve that you that you said to yourself, I, "I'm not buying that. I don't believe it. I'm not going to write it. It's just too much for me." Hmm. Um, I think. You know, I, I, as an academic, I'm trained to be skeptical. And I think we definitely had our scully moments here and there um, <laughs> where uh, where I would sort of put the brakes on a little bit or ask different kinds of questions. Or, And I think, you know, there were moments when we, would, we got into some of the sort of ancient aliens type thing where I was saying, well, I, I don't know that I buy that. I was trained uh, in part as an Egyptologist, um, I worked a little bit as an archaeologist uh, before I became uh, a Shakespeare professor. And so I know a little bit about things like hieroglyphs. So when people say, look, there's a hieroglyph representing a UFO, I can I can look at that and say, actually, I, I, I no, I don't think that's what it is, and here's why. And I, I understand how the, the grammar of this works, and that's not what this would be doing. So, you know, whenever we ran into something that... Well, we weren't in agreement. I think we backed away and said, "Well, okay, so let's push it into a, into an area where we are much more sort of on the pay, on the same page, and we're and we're more sure of what we're saying because you want to be able to believe what it is that you're doing." Um, I don't I don't think there's anything in the book where I say I, I'm writing something that I I actually believe to be false. You know, I don't think that's the case at all. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. A.J. Hartley, thanks for joining us. Appreciate your insight. Uh, I read the book. It's a, it's a wonderful read, and it's going to be a great movie, assuming that it, it is made into a movie. I want to thank you for joining us. We're going to be back with uh, Tom DeLong in a moment and get into the meat of this, uh, who these people are he's been talking to, at least uh, a general description. And if you wonder what he does when he's not chasing UFO mysteries, uh, this is a song from his band, Angels and Airwaves. It's called Tunnels. From 2014, a song called Ends of the Earth.
the ethereal sound of Lord Huron. We're talking with musician Tom DeLong, uh, whose band Angels and Airwaves were heard a couple of minutes ago. He's sort of redirected and refocused uh, much of his energies and his fortune into the pursuit and launching of a project called Secret Machines, a multi-platform project, films, documentaries, books, music, uh, to explore the kinds of themes that we discuss on this program often. And he's told us that he has a, a group of advisors within and without government who've been telling him things they say is the real truth about these mysteries. So the obvious questions, how do we know they're telling the truth? Are they leading him down the path? Are they giving him disinformation? How can he prove any of this stuff to be real? We're going to get into all that stuff in our upcoming segments here on Coast to Coast AM. Our thanks again to A.J. Hartley for joining us to talk about Secret Machines Chasing Shadows, the first uh, novel in the series of books being launched uh, under this multi-platform project that Tom DeLong has uh, been describing for us. Uh, Tom, let's get down to the brass tacks, though. You had this project sort of in mind before you met these guys, right? I did. Yeah, I did. I um, didn't quite know how I was going to get the support that I wanted. I had ideas of how to start, but, um, you know, I'm the kind of guy that's always sniffed out if there is an opportunity somewhere to push something forward that, that seemed difficult. You know, it's just looking for opportunities in everyday life, and, and I've had a few of those in this kind of category. But, um, you know, in the foreword of the novel, so we've been talking about the novel. It's going to come out, It's what is it, April 5th. It'll be everywhere. But, um, you know, I sent a few versions out to people before uh, to read it, but the foreword wasn't in there. But this book will have the foreword in it. I describe a series of events that, that started a lot of this stuff. And um, I, and I think that that, that is, is a pretty interesting story. Well, uh, let's uh, let's get into it. You you made this decision, and it's 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 risky for you. I mean, I I remember when you just making the decision at the announcement. All right, look, I'm done with Blink 182. There are people online that practically want to shoot you, I and mean, they they were really mad. But I mean, it's it's risky for you financially uh, to do this. I mean, it's the Secret Machines is a big project. It's got to be financially viable, or it doesn't doesn't make it. Yeah, you know, it's it's a real project. I have a company that needs the projects to work. Um, you know, it's uh the whole thing is risky in many ways. I I think we can even start back a little earlier. Um, you know, there's going to be a teaser that launches here shortly that has uh some clips from the documentary side of things that I'm doing. And in it there is a person that's silhouetted that's been a very, very high-level defense contractor, an engineer, um, out at uh, Groom Lake, Area 51, for decades. And uh, he says something in that teaser. But that person, um, long ago, I remember when I, when I was telling him a little bit about what I wanted to do, uh, he gave me a call the next day and um, called me on a video chat. So he gets on there, and he goes, I made calls about you, and I said, "Really?" And he said, "Yeah, I, I did." He goes, "You really, you better be really effing careful. If someone comes up to you and asks you to get in the car and go for a ride, don't get in that car." And I laughed it off, and I said, "Come on, man! I, you know, I, I literally—it sounded like a movie to me." So I kind of just chuckled, and he goes, "I'm being really effing serious with you right now. If someone comes by and asks you to go for a ride, don't get in the car. I am not effing." around with you and he's pointing at me i'm being very serious you're playing with some serious stuff using different words you know and at that point my heart was beating really fast and i said you're being you're being very serious right now aren't you he said yes i'm being very very serious with you you know and because of that conversation uh you know all the events that transpired after that when i started meeting certain people i went in very very respectful and asked for permission on everything that I did and um and treated it the way, you know, that these guys treat it, which is it's it's it is a national and global security issue. Let's talk about the process of how you sort of pierce the veil cuz that's what people are going to have trouble buying. How is this guy? How is it this rock star guy gains access to this when so many people, senators and and researchers and scientists and spooks who've tried to look for this stuff couldn't find it. How do you get the access? Why, how do you explain that? Well, let me, let me, might as well just tell you the story. So yeah. the, the, the way the first, 
you know, it's, it spells this out a little bit in the foreword to the book, but um, I had an opportunity to go to an event. So uh, the most classified and uh, the most advanced group of engineers and scientists that work within the military industrial complex work under one, one specific group. And it's a, it's a very, very quiet group. But for the very first time, they were doing an event where family members can come and, and not go in the buildings, but at least celebrate in the parking lot what their loved ones do during the day, you know. And they asked me, um, you know, would you come up and because I knew this one individual that told me to be really careful, you know, he goes, hey, look, this is, this is a way for you to come up and, and see a little bit about what we're doing. And I said, oh, my God, I, I would love to. And he said, do you want to come and introduce uh, the head of the company to the crowd? And I said, I will if I get to sit with him for five minutes. I don't know why I said that. I just knew that that was an opportunity that, you know, guys like me would kill because I knew exactly who these, this group of, of – uh, engineers were. I knew exactly what they do, you know. So the the head guy, are you kidding me? Yeah, let me lock me in a room with this dude. And um, so uh, I got that opportunity. I went up and I did the introduction to the crowd, and then I got the five minutes uh, to sit down alone and and say whatever it was I wanted to say. So at that time, I didn't say anything about this this subject. I um, just said, hey, I have an idea for a project, and this project, I think, if it's done correctly will reverse the cynicism that people have about government and what people have about the, you know, frankly, the military industrial complex. I think that if I do this, um, you, you know, places like this and other arms of the government would, would be, would be happy that it got communicated. And, but I, but I didn't bring up anything that was, you know, um, you didn't mention UFOs. You don't mention UFOs. Don't even do that because you won't. You'll get kicked right out of the door. You know. So uh, he goes, okay, that that's great. Um, and I said, can I come up in a couple of weeks and tell you more about it? Absolutely. So a couple of weeks go by, then I come back up. I go through four layers of security. I go through machine guns, guys with machine guns, and then I get escorted into a very specific building that's with a bunch of buildings. This is somewhere out in the middle of the desert, somewhere. And uh, and then I go through two layers of electronic code entry systems and then the, you hear the lock go you know they make their sounds and the doors open up now i'm in a hallway and that hallway has speakers lining the ceiling and just playing white noise kind of like tv static um and that's there so you don't hear anybody's conversations uh and the, and the, the hallway also has a series of doors and all the doors have kind of like those big rotary locks like a safe lock on them so then we so we go through that, that hallway and then they just twist the, the knobs on the doors and then you hear the big sound and that door opens up and now I'm in the center of the building where the top uh, three engineers work with the, the head of the company. And so I walk in and they're sitting there and they're ready for what it is I wanted to, to pitch them. So, you know, I'm nervously trying to figure out what I'm going to say. Um, I had no idea that you know i i had no plan for even bringing up ufos then either i was smarter than that so we're talking and one person apparently did a bunch of research on me and knew that i was all into the subject so halfway through the conversation uh this person says so what about all the conspiracy stuff that you're in into and just so now i'm being eyeballed by three very important people and i'm just totally got caught you know and i'm like oh my god what am i going to do right now so i i tried to talk my way out of it and then in comes the head of the company, the big, big dude, uh, and, and uh, kind of save the moment. But at the same time, you know, uh, he got introduced to the conversation right at that point. So right when he, right, you know, I, I said, you know, you come in at a very interesting part of the conversation. Uh, this person brought up, you know, the whole UFO issue with me. Um, I just want you to know that uh, I don't plan on you know, treating that disrespectfully with this project. And then I got interrupted. And the head guy says, we cannot be involved with anything that has anything to do with that subject, especially since there has been absolutely no evidence whatsoever that it exists. So bam, I'm just cut off right there. And now I'm, my heart's racing. And I'm like, where do I do? So the only thing that I can think of at the moment is I said, well, Edgar Allan Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, is out telling all the young people of the world that this is real. So we have a credibility issue that we have to attack, but we don't have to attack it here or now, and we could talk this through. 
It's just something that young people think, and I want you to know a little bit more about my project. And so I got my way through. I was like, oh, my God, I, I'm still here. So they said, okay, continue. So that specific meeting ended, and then I just said, you know, uh, hell with it. I said, sir, can I speak to you for five minutes alone? This is the, this is the Tom that even my old band members know of. You know, I'll just go for something. Uh, this is the punk rock kid inside of me, right? So, uh, and he goes, sure. And so the other people kind of look at me weird, and they're like, okay, so we leave. And I kind of looked at them, so they did. So they stood up, and I, I, I shut the door. And now I'm in the middle of all these different layers of security, and I'm sitting with this person, I, and I just, I just go for broke. I just go, this is exactly what I said. I want you to understand something. And, and, I, and I sit down two feet in front of him, and he's staring at me in the suit. And I go, I understand the national security implications about, about what I'm about to say. Um, I am not naive to the, to the topic. Um, and uh, I, I think if you hear me out, you're going to see that there's merit in what I'm about to propose. And, uh, and, he goes, well, and he goes, well, what topic are you talking about? And I go, UFOs, sir. Now, this is what I want to try and do. And so then I just laid out this entire Secret Machines project idea. And I said, I'm going to send – and I said, but the, over the past 30 years, there's been a program to indoctrinate people to the idea that this might be real. But the problem is, is all the young adults of the world, they use the Internet. They have iPhones. They talk to each other much quicker than people ever have. So this program that everyone's been following from the 50s is far outdated. It's antiquated. People have surpassed it, and now they don't trust you guys. Now they don't like you guys. Now they graduate from MIT, and they want to work for Elon Musk, and they don't want to work here. Help, help me help you guys. And, um, and he, then he stops me, because I said, frankly, there's been some bad things that have happened for the past 30 years on the subject, and he stops me, and I'm kind of going, okay, so now I'm in trouble. I just went right into this stuff. What's going to happen? And, and he looks at me. He takes a breath, and he goes, what kind of bad things has the government done with the subject? Very, very like calm and, 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 and staring me straight in the eyes. And so I came up with a couple, a couple things that I can't say here. And, um, and, and I said, if you allow me to do this, what I'm trying to do, then, then, then I'm going to ask you for some help. I need advisors. I need people to help guide me so I don't keep disinforming people. I will not do that anymore. We need to tell the truth. And I just, you know what I said at the time? I said, you got to picture those little chickens running across the road and someone's guiding them. I'm all, I'm that little chicken and I'm racing, but I don't want to get hit by a car along the way, you know? And, uh, but it was no joke when there was nothing, there was nothing to laugh at during this time. So I said, I'm going to send you something. I want you to read it. And please, if you find anything about it good, you know, uh, if there's any kind of merit in this at all, I would just just respond any way you can because I didn't think he could respond in an email or anything. He goes, okay, thank you for that, and then then the meeting was done. So what I did was the nonfiction books that we've been working on right next to the Secret Machines novel and, and parallel has it's a it's a thesis of the UFO phenomenon. So I took the prologue to that thesis and I sent it to him. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, what did I do? What did I do? I shouldn't have sent in an email. Obviously, you don't sit in an email. Every email you have with this group, it has all these, like, government, um, you know, stamps all over the email because, you know, it goes, through, it goes through DOD servers and all this stuff. But I had no other way to get it to them, so I did. So I just sat there, and I didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. I was like, okay, that relationship's done. I fried that thing. I went in there talking about, you know, I tell people it's like walking into somebody – during World War II and say, hey, about that nuclear bomb you're building in secret, you know, I want to talk to you about that. That's, that's basically what I did. Um, well, two weeks later, I get this email and it says, I want you to be next to the Pentagon at this date and this time you're going to be meeting somebody from the CIA, basically. It's, it said it in a different way, but I can't say what it said. And so I, I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like, it's, it's working. So I get on a plane and I fly out to dc uh and this is where it gets pretty sketchy but it, it was insane so i i uh i go to my meeting i had to go to a very specific location that was within a rock's throw of the pentagon and i go to the back of a room at a certain location and there's two guys in suits waiting at a table for me so i go and i sit down at the table and uh the person i was talking to is one of the persons. And he goes, I think this would be a good time for you to tell this person what you told me. 
and uh, and I'm sitting there kind of in my mind, I'm going, well, what do I say? Do I tell him everything I told you or some of the things? Am I allowed to tell him that I told you these things? Or I had no idea what to say, so I said, okay, I'll just go for it. So I went through the exact same pitch. At the so I talked for about twenty some minutes because they were just eyeballing me like hawks, you know. So I don't. I at this point, I, I just don't know. I've never been in these situations before, so I didn't know if I was saying the wrong thing or not. But I was just trying to be very respectful, and I went through with it. And I finished my speech, and the person is just staring at me. I mean, these squinting eyes, you know, the beard, the suit. I mean, looks exactly straight out of a movie, an espionage movie. Uh, takes a breath and goes, things like this don't happen at the White House. They don't happen at the Hill. They happen in places like this, at tables like this, where a few men get together and decide to push the ball down the field. And then the meeting was done. I mean, done, like a movie done. Uh, so the very next day, I got sent over to NASA. And I'm, I'm, I'm at the highest levels at NASA, I, and I, I decided to do the same thing where I ask everyone to leave. So uh, I, this one person, uh, I did the pitch one more time. And they said, you need to meet somebody. So that person flies out to San Diego. I go to another meeting. We get on a, a conference call. And this person is a very important um, in the military. I can't say which branch, but the highest level of ranks, but then after they left that particular branch of the military, they did something very, very important for another agency. And that person says, come fly and meet me up here in San Francisco. So I within the next 48 hours. So I got on a plan and I go there. And now I'm sitting on a, a NASA Ames. Um, NASA has three, three divisions. There's Ames Research, JPL, and then just NASA, the traditional NASA that everyone knows. I'm at Ames Research Center, and I go through my whole pitch again, and this person um, stops me and goes, uh, I just want you to know I'm a skeptic on this stuff. And I said, I understand that, sir, but I, I knew you would say that, but let me just continue and tell you what I'm trying to do. 20 minutes later, I just want you to know I'm just, I'm a skeptic. And I go, I know, I know you are. You already said that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, I, and I keep talking. And by the time I got to, to kind of concluding what this project would be, he just staring at me. And then he takes a deep breath and says, introduce him to the general. And then I was like, well, who's that? And they're both just staring at me because there was this guy that was right next to him, uh, a very serious guy. And, uh, I, all of a sudden, on my email two hours later, I'm talking to somebody that has changed the entire course of this whole project. So I get on the phone with that person that same evening, and I go through the same situation. So I'm starting to t walk through what I'm trying to do and how, I'm, how I plan to do it. And this person goes, I want you to know I'm a skeptic on this stuff. And I go, sir, I knew you would say that, uh, but let me explain a little bit more. So I walk through it again. And then the, the person goes, I, uh, I just got to say it. I'm a skeptic. You know, it was, it was, it was verbatim. What they I all do it, right? They, they all, they they all, all do it. it. They all do it. But on the third time, he goes, I swore an oath to my country. And I said, sir, I know you did. And I'm not asking for you to give me classified information. I don't deserve it. But I think if you understand what I'm about to do with this project, you may think it deserves your attention. And then he goes, I'm afraid what you might find is a bunch of men in suits standing around an elephant. And I said, I'm, I, I'm, I was afraid you were going to say that, but can you help me? And he says, fly out and meet me. And that's where – that's – That's that's where things this, get interesting. This is where things get interesting. So um, I fly out. I'll tell you what, Tom, point. we're going to take a break here in a minute. Uh, so you're, you're about to get into some really good stuff. We're going to save it to the other side. Uh, I should say that as, uh, without giving too much away, you and I had some conversations along the way, too. And um, and I heard your pitch uh, evolve and it got pretty good. I mean, after a while, you got pretty practiced at it. And maybe we'll hear a little bit more about the pitch in the next segment. And then you can tell us about uh, the general uh, much more to come here on Coast to Coast AM. 